Thank you for coming to listen to the Lichen Sclerosis Podcast. My name is Kathy, and this is our journal of learning about and living with lichen sclerosis. Each week, I research an aspect of lichen sclerosis or speak to someone related to lichen sclerosis. This week, I've got a treat for you. We're talking to someone who's been in the front line of lichen sclerosis research. But before I introduce my guest, I want to invite you to join us at the Lichen Sclerosis Support Network. It's a positive community of women who are looking to accept our diagnosis, learn to manage our illness, and get back to living our happy, healthy lives. If that sounds like a place you'd like to be, come join us at lssupport.net and sign up to join the community. So our guest this week is the one and only Leah Mitchell. She is a talented young woman who has been touched by lichen sclerosis. She's been a clinical research coordinator on many lichen sclerosis studies, including some that I've covered on this very podcast. She has been a medical scribe and clinical assistant for four years for Dr. Andrew Goldstein at the Center of Vulval Vaginal Disorders in Washington, D.C., mostly working with lichen sclerosis patients. She is a lady who knows her stuff, and she has brought us some gems. Our guest had so much to tell us, I've had to break our conversation into two episodes. So this week, we are going to talk about the state of lichen sclerosis today. And we cover everything from what causes LS to how do you treat LS. And we dive deep into some treatments. You are not going to want to miss this episode. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Leah Mitchell. Hi, Leah. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to get in your head and learn about research and all of the clinical things that are happening around lichen sclerosis. Hi, Kathy. It's good to be here. I'm very excited to be able to spread all the news and information that we have about lichen sclerosis currently in the clinical world. So you've been part of a lot of clinical trials, and I want to talk about the vulvar lichen sclerosis current perspectives. So you guys did a review of all the past clinical trials and came up with the current perspective. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And it was a more broad review. It was the current clinical trials and also what we know about the pathogenesis, the manifestation of this disease in women. And what did you find? So an overview for the pathogenesis portion is in the etiology, meaning how LS develops is unclear, but there is strong, strong, strong evidence that suggests that it's an autoimmune disorder with a genetic component. So if your mother has lichen sclerosis, then you have an increased chance of having lichen sclerosis. And the other reason why we find it to believe it's an autoimmune disorder is that it's more prevalent in women, just like all other autoimmune disorders. And we found many factors that point us to autoimmune disorders like antigens on specific cells in our body. And then for the clinical presentation, it's the same. That hasn't really changed. The main symptoms we see in patients with lichen sclerosis are pruritus, which is itching, dyspareunia, which is pain with intercourse, and then vulvar pain. And we also see issues with sexual dysfunction, again, with tearing during intercourse, and also women with LS tend to be less sexually active because it doesn't feel good down there. They don't feel sexy. They don't feel ready to engage in intercourse. And so women who have this are less sexually active. I actually did look at a study during episode seven when we talked about sex and like in sclerosis. And the study did show that women who have lichen sclerosis do have less sex and 
less pleasurable sex. Yes. So it's definitely something that affects our sex life, which then affects our relationships, which then, of course, affects all of our mental health and everything. 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 I can't tell you the countless times that we've seen like in sclerosis patients that come in and they're just at their wit's end. They're like, my relationship's falling apart. I don't know what to do. I don't feel good about myself. My self-esteem has plummeted. And it it's heart-wrenching because this is a disease that affects you brutally and nobody knows how to diagnose it. As we talked about in this paper, it takes on average five to 15 years for a diagnosis. Which is crazy. They're going five to 15 years without being diagnosed with this. And that means that they're obviously going to people They're going to providers and they're trying to find someone that can diagnose them and they clearly aren't finding that. The problem with this disease is that you don't want to wait five to 15 years before you get diagnosed because by that time you could have cancer and that is what is really scary. Right. Or you could be fused to the point where now your sexual organs are not functional You know, you have so much pain that you don't even want to be touched. And now Mm -hmm. you've got marital issues or relationship issues and you're trying to get help and you can't find anyone to help you. I actually talked about that with Dr. Eden in my previous interview. Those are the last two episodes. If you want to go back and listen to those, there has to be a better training. Uh, There has to be more concise and more awareness on the doctor side so that when we come to the doctor, they know what to look for and not just dismiss us. And if they don't know what they're looking for, they need to continue to look or refer us to someone who knows how to look and what they're looking for. Yes, exactly. And it really is a disease caught between two specialties because It is a dermatological disease, but dermatologists don't typically look down there and gynecologists aren't typically trained in dermatology. So when they are down there, they don't know what they're looking at. So I agree, we need to better educate. So what is the best way to diagnose lichen sclerosis? Because they keep getting it wrong. So what does the research say? The main way to diagnose lichen sclerosis, it's important that you take a biopsy before any treatment has been started. Because if you start a treatment, it's going to alter that biopsy result. So a biopsy to confirm lichen sclerosis is very important and necessary. Also, because we don't have a cure for lichen sclerosis right now. So if someone is optimally treating their lichen sclerosis and they look like they're perfect, they're in remission, they don't have any symptoms, they have no scarring, they can go to a new doctor and that doctor can be like, why are you applying this topical Betazole. It's the most potent steroid we have out there. You need to stop doing this. Mm -hmm. When in reality, they need to keep maintaining it because their lichen sclerosis will come back out of remission if they don't keep treating it. So it's important to have that biopsy to let providers know, like, no, I have a biopsy proving that I have lichen sclerosis. I need to be on this treatment regimen in order to prevent from progression of the disease and prevent from potential cancer. So biopsies are very important and having the right person read the biopsy is important as well. So you can't just take the biopsy and send it away. You have to tell them what you're looking for. Okay. So that's important for the physician or your medical provider to inform the pathologist of that diagnosis. Dr. Eden and I actually spoke about that as well. She definitely recommends that every 
body who is diagnosed has a biopsy. She yeah. said she does for all of her patients just because lichen sclerosis symptoms are so similar to so many other conditions that you don't want to give somebody the wrong diagnosis. You don't want to give them the wrong treatment and make their symptoms and their condition worse. So you definitely want to have that biopsy to confirm your suspicions. Yes, it's very, very important. So as far as treatments, what did you find in the review? When we talk about treatments for lichen sclerosis, we have first line treatments, second line, third line, and then further down the line. Our first line treatment, which is our gold standard treatment for LS right now, is ultra potent topical corticosteroids. Most commonly used is our clobetazole ointment. Ointment is better than the cream as it absorbs better. And the current guidelines, there's a lot of variation with medical providers, but the current guidelines is once a day for one month, and then you decrease to every other day for one month, and then you decrease to twice weekly for a third month. And then this is where the variation begins regarding maintenance therapy. Some people and some providers say after the third month of twice weekly, you can stop and use it as needed. Mm -hmm. Some people will say, no, you need to continue it twice weekly for the rest of your life. Okay. And that is where it gets a little hazy. And that's where people say that, you know, I did the clubetazole treatment, how they told me, but it just doesn't work for me. I did the once a day for one month, the every other day for one month, and then the twice weekly for three months. And then I use it every now and then whenever it's really itchy, but it seems like I'm using it all the time as needed because it's not working. There's a specific ways to use it and they don't dive into it in this specific perspective publication that we wrote because there really isn't data. Mm-hmm looking at it, but the best way to apply it is soaking in a bath or soaking in water before applying to help it get in and really rubbing in the medication Mm -hmm. so that it absorbs completely. So instead of just putting on a small layer and just sitting and letting it absorb by itself, it's better to really rub it in because the areas that are getting the inflammation are the basement membrane of your skin. So you got to get deep into that basement membrane and you do it by soaking and then applying. But most people don't know about that aspect of it because it's not really talked about. I've known about it through Dr. Goldstein. I agree because my doctor, she pretty much, she gave me the prescription. She told me to use it once a day, come back in two weeks And if I was better, then I had LS. So I did it once a day. I got better. And then when I went back, she just said, okay, now you just use it whenever you need it. So I didn't even get the, you know, once a day and then drop down to every other day and then two times a week. I didn't even do that. And I do feel like because I only use it occasionally when I have a flare up, thankfully my symptoms only come up every now and again. And compared to a lot of other people, they're pretty mild. So I only use my clobetazole every, I would say maybe once every two, three weeks. But what I noticed about, I wouldn't say about a month ago, I noticed that my labia minora just is, it's gone you know? Mm -hmm. So I, and I definitely attribute that to the fact that I, I, first off, I wasn't even using the clobetazole on my labia minora. I only use it Mm -hmm. around my clitoral hood because that's the only place that I itch. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I needed to put it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So again, training for doctors so that they can give us the proper procedures to follow and the information that we need is so critical. It's very critical. 
That's why I have my new website up. It has all the information as far as what lichen sclerosis is, what treatments are out there, what symptoms to look out for. And then I'll add this to that as far as generally recommended treatment procedures that you can make sure you go over with your doctor. Yes, that is very important for every woman that's diagnosed with lichen sclerosis to have because like you said, people don't know that resorption, which is the term for basically loss of your labia minora, that is a common side effect of lichen sclerosis. A lot of women get labia minora resorption and some might think it's because of the clobetazole, but in reality, if, if you're controlling the LS with the clobetazole, you shouldn't have any resorption. There is so much research out there that proves that topical clobetazole is a very effective treatment for lichen sclerosis. And that is why it is first line because we do have so much research that supports the benefit of using clobetazole. While we're talking about that, on the flip side, I've also heard that uh, a lot of women are afraid to use the clobetazole because it is a steroid and they don't want to use it for the rest of their life because they're afraid of side effects. What is the science behind that? So you can get side effects. If you're getting systemic absorption, you can get systemic side effects but you should really not be applying that much to begin with. And if you're using it the right way, if you're soaking and really rubbing it in well and only using the amount that you should, which should really be no more than a chickpea to cover the entire area. And I mean entire area all the way from your prey puce, which covers your clitoris to around your anus. Oh. And that's really not that much. You want to go inside the labia majora, right? Yeah. There's no need to go inside the vagina. Right. You do not need to put it inside the vagina. What about on outside of the labia majora where the hair is? Yeah. But everywhere you see active lichen sclerosis, and that's what's important is informing the patient where their active disease is, because if they don't know where it's active, they have some symptoms are worse in some areas than others, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that it's not active in other areas. And so showing them the line being like, okay, this is where I start to see the hypopigmentation, which is the depigmentation. So your skin is turning almost a white color Mm -hmm. and anything that is white or depigmented should be treated. Okay. So that's what's really important with treatment is the location and the patient knowing where their lichen sclerosis extends to. So the doctor should definitely be showing us how much to apply, where to mm-hmm. apply it, and telling us how often to apply it. Yes, 100%. They should have a mirror in the exam room for you to hold up to your vulva, and they should be pointing to the areas where you have active disease, or they should take a photo on your phone that you can go home and take, and you can kind of edit it. You know how you have the edit tool on your phone. You can draw a line of where all of your disease is. So they should really be taking that time because this is a pre-malignant condition. This isn't something to just like send them with a prescription and be like, okay, good luck. <laughs> like my- That should not happen. And yes, it happens that should not happen. every day. It happens, it happens every all the time. day. Yes. The time. I will definitely be adding this information to the website. I might even actually cut out that clip and put it on the FAQ because that is yes. monumental. Thank you for that. Yes, of course. So moving on from our first line, we're going to go to our second line treatment, which is called topical calcineurin inhibitors. This is your tacrolimus and your pemcrolimus. So these are also topical medications that can be used. However, there have been studies showing that these topical calcineurin inhibitors are not as effective as your topical 
potent, ultra potent corticosteroids like clobetazole. So that's why this is considered second line because of the data out there that shows that it is just not as effective. So you use it for women that don't really have benefits with the corticosteroids. But again, it's all about how you use the corticosteroids that make it beneficial. And then our next couple of treatments I'm going to talk about, these are the ones that are being studied now. They're not really considered second line. It's more like third, fourth, fifth line, essentially. It's just, these are, okay, our topical medications aren't working. And these are also in the clinical trials. We have platelet-rich plasma injections, and then we have energy-based modalities, which include our lasers, our Mona Lisa laser that everyone knows about, also what's called photodynamic therapy, and then high-intensity focus ultrasound. I'm going to talk first about the energy-based modalities. Okay. Our photodynamic therapy, it's a photosensitizing agent. It uses light waves and oxygen, and it's supposed to help make healthy tissue and target cells that play a role in inflammation and fibrosis. And that way it limits the damage to your healthy tissue. However, the research isn't promising and we need more research out there before we can even offer it to anyone. If anyone's offering photodynamic therapy and saying that it's a treatment, it's really just research that they're doing on you. It's like, okay, does it work? We don't know. So it's just a trial and error if they try that. Okay. And then the high intensity focus ultrasound. Now this one has showed a lot of promising results. It's not really widely used right now in clinical research, but there has been research on it. I'm sure that there will be more to come once this kind of phase of the Mona Lisa laser therapy dwindles. I did uh, review a clinical trial that was done in China on the ultrasound treatment. That was episode eight. What do I do if my topical medication stops working? Mm -hmm. That one they studied and they followed the patients for five years. At first they had a very high percentage that did get better. 50% of the women who were treated actually said they were cured. No, you know, no symptoms. And then another like 45% had improved symptoms. But then when they went back a year and then five years later, they had all pretty much regressed after they were all done. It was about 12%, if I remember correctly, that still had benefits from the treatments. Is that what you're showing? Yep. And Yep, that's that exact study. So for anyone that wants to read up on it, the name of the study is High Intensity Focused Ultrasound Treatment for Non-Neoplastic Epithelial Disorders of the Vulva. So your your numbers were just about spot on. Great memory. I have a link to that in the show notes as well. And yeah, it did show 10% disease reoccurrence. And, you know, I'm not surprised because... It's not a cure. We're using this as a treatment. We don't have a cure for lichen sclerosis. We're trying to do these so you don't have to use the corticosteroids. It would be a replacement, hopefully, is the idea um, that you can have these procedures like the laser done ever so often instead of applying topical clobetazole every twice a week for the rest of your life. Right. So we're trying to find something that can space it out. And that's why it is showing promising results, but they're not continuing the treatment. So that's right. why they're going to get recurrent symptoms because again, it's not, not a cure. Looking at it through that lens, it makes more sense. I guess me as a patient, I'm looking at, okay, I want to do something and just, you know, be good. But yeah, looking at it as it's not a cure, it's a treatment. So it's it's a treatment that you'll have to redo again at some point and then just keep redoing it at some point. I get that now. Yes. And the hopes are is that one day, you know, research 
itself takes a while because you got to go through FDA and do all these things and gather the data, publish the paper. And eventually the hopes is, is to get it FDA approved as a treatment rather than FDA approved as a device. And therefore insurances will cover it right now. Hallelujah. Right now. It's all out of pocket. For example, the CO2 laser, also known as the Mona Lisa laser, is an FDA-approved device. It's not an FDA-approved treatment, so you're paying out of pocket. Your insurance is not covering it. So for like three treatments of the CO2 laser, it's like $3,000. It's insane. Yeah. Who has that kind of money? So especially for something that's not a cure. Right. Now, if it were a cure, that would be great. So the HIFU, which is a high-intensity focus ultrasound, does show promising results. We need more studies out there. And then the last energy-based modality, which is the hot topic these days, is the CO2 fractional laser. And it is definitely shown positive results in treating vaginal atrophy, And they propose that it can be used to treat LS, but there is no data out there. So that is why we did the Mona Lisa study. And it is a double-blind, placebo-controlled study looking at the effects of the laser versus what we call a sham laser, which is just the same exact laser, but we just change all the settings so that it does not have any effect on the skin. Mm -hmm. So that study, those results are being processed by yours truly. And soon enough, we will have those results, hopefully really soon. Once we get everything finalized, I just pop in the rest of the information and then it should get published. Awesome. I am looking so forward to reading that once that comes out, because according to the two clinical trials that I did talk about in episode eight, it seems like it's viable and it, it looks like it, it's going to work at least for a set time. And it doesn't cause pain like the PRP treatment can. You don't have as much discomfort using the laser treatment versus the PRP. 100%. I mean, I cannot agree with you more. Watching both trials and the treatments and the procedures be done It is very painful to get the PRP injections and it takes a lot more time because we have to pull 60 cc's of blood from you. That's a massive uh, syringe that we use. And doing that alone is not comfortable because we're using a very large gauge needle to get that much blood. Mm -hmm. And then you have to wait 30 minutes to spin down. So you're sitting there waiting for 30 minutes in the exam room And then the blood spun down and then the doctor comes in and does the treatment. And that treatment is not fun because we used a 27 gauge needle and that's not that small either for that area. And we do put a topical numbing medication on you, but it only does so much. I mean, it's a great numbing medication that we use, but it only does so much. And then with the Mona Lisa laser, There's no waiting. I mean, we put the numbing medication on you and we wait 15 to 20 minutes with the numbing medication on. And then we come in, wipe it completely off. And then the actual procedure takes about five minutes, if even. Wow. Yeah, I actually saw on Instagram the other day, there was a video of a doctor talking while he was doing the procedure And the lady, she was just chilling there. Yeah. (laughs) It's definitely definitely not comfortable if you don't put any type of numbing ointment on for, especially for women with lichen sclerosis, because a lot of women will come in with fissures, meaning a tear in their skin. And when you go over that tear, it's not fun. How I describe microablation is like aerating the grass. If anyone's familiar with that, you poke holes in the grass to help it grow better. Have you seen a study or done any studies with the stem cell combo, the stem cell PRP combo? Yes. So we talk about it in this write-up and 
The only problem with it is we don't know if it's the PRP or if it's the mesenchymal stem cells that are helping because they're using it in conjunction or if it's together. So that's why it's important to study the PRP alone and then study stem cells alone. We did not do a stem cell study, but there have been some. I have not done as much research in stem cells, but what I have learned from the stem cells and working with Dr. Goldstein is that the stem cells aren't effective, but maybe it's the combo of this PRP and mesenchymal stem cells that are effective. Let's hope we get that research sometime soon so we can get long-term effective treatments. Are there any other treatments that we should be looking out for? So to recap, our gold standard, our first line treatment is our topical ultra potent steroids. And then we have our second line treatment, which is going to be the topical calcineurin inhibitors. And then after that, we have all of the things that are currently out there in the clinical trials, which are the platelet rich plasma and then your energy-based modalities, the photodynamic therapy, the high-intensity focus ultrasound, and the fractional CO2 laser. And then the final thing I did want to talk about in treatment is we have the clobetazole. It works great. It does not reverse the scarring that you already have. So if you come in, again, 5 to 15 years it takes for people to get diagnosed. That's 5 to 15 years that you're Lichen sclerosis can develop and can cause scarring, can cause fusing of your clitoris, closure of your vaginal opening. I've seen many women that would get recurrent UTIs because their urine was literally hitting up against their scarring because it had scarred their opening open. So they would get urine that would just basically sit in the opening of their vagina and cause infection. So there are ways to reverse the scarring. However, the only way to reverse it is through surgery. But the positive side of the surgery is that it's very minimally invasive. And all it is doing is just basically opening up what you lost and cutting away the scarring. And there have been so many promising outcomes with these surgeries. Dr. Goldstein is one of the best. I mean, if I had lichen sclerosis, I wouldn't let anyone do this surgery except for Goldstein because he knows what he's doing. He's done so many. And also the people that work there, Dr. Sarah Signa and Dr. Jill Kraft also do this surgery. They were trained by Dr. Goldstein. And it's a very simple surgery. Not many people know about it, but it improves your sex life. Leah, thank you so much for coming and sharing all of your knowledge with us today. I look forward to continuing our conversation in next week's episode. Tell us where we can find you on the internet. You can find me on Instagram, the Women's Health PAS. And is there anywhere else? If you would like to follow the Center for Vulva Vaginal Disorders and stay up to date on their research and publications, you can go to volvodynia.com. Perfect. I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Thank you once again. You're amazing. Thank you. It was such a great time. I appreciate it. And that's my conversation this week with Leah Mitchell. So what do we learn today? Hmm. We learn they still don't know what really causes lichen sclerosis. They figure it runs in the family and it's autoimmune related. They don't have a cure, but we do have treatments. We have a way to manage our LS. And they're working on some long-term treatments. So who knows what the future is going to bring? The fact that they are researching these longer-term treatments is a good thing. And if we can get them FDA approved, oh my goodness, that means we ain't got to be maintenance in ourselves every day, which would be amazing because I am horrible at maintenance, but that's a tale for another day. 
Be sure to check the show notes for all the links mentioned in this episode. Before I leave you, don't forget to come sign up at the Lichen Sclerosis Support Network at lssupport.net and come talk to me. Let me know you're from the podcast when you sign up. Don't forget to subscribe. And I look forward to being in your ear next week when Leah and I talk all things clinical trials. We're going to tell you some clinical trials that are open if you're interested in getting into some and what it takes to be in them. So make sure you come back next week and take a listen. All right. Have an amazing week. And I will see you then. Bye.